Gentlemen, the Honourable Scott Morrison MP is the Treasurer and a senior member of the Prime Minister Turnbull's Cabinet and Expenditure Review Committee. He was previously appointed Minister for Social Services in 2014 and was responsible for driving the Coalition Government's welfare reform strategy designed to increase the economic participation of Australians and ensure the long-term sustainability of Australia's welfare safety net. He is a very hard-working man. It is great to have him here and uh, the treasurer of our country, ladies and gentlemen, and he's a shark supporter. Big round of applause for Scott Morrison, MP. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Are there any sharks in the house? <laughs> well, there's, there's at least two. <laughs> oh, we've got a few down here. I've got the Sharky's tie on. After our great win on the weekend over North Queensland, and the Sharks are warming up to the finals, Tim, no doubt about that. We made our run about this time last year, and so we're very excited about the weeks ahead. It'll be a great clash against the Roosters down there at Shark Park on the weekend. Don't worry, I'm, I'm going to talk about something other than rugby league this afternoon. But um, it's, it's one of the things I think the Australian-Lebanese community shares, I think, more broadly is their passion, passion for rugby league and uh, produce some great players, as we know, and, uh, and just love the game. Um, it's one of those things in sport that we all enjoy that brings Australians together. Uh, and uh, we have a lot to look forward to in the weeks ahead. Now, bear with me as I'm going to give you a special welcome today. I'm not known for my linguistics. I struggle with English, uh, but uh, here we go. Nahakum Saeed. Close? Close? You can put up scores if you like. Anamab Sut Kun Makun. Close? Inshallah. Into Takunu Mab Sutin. Good day, I'm happy to be with you, and I hope you're also happy to be here as well. I'm certainly happy to be here. I am an honorary citizen of Hadin, according to the unofficial mayor of Hadin in Australia, Joseph Saf, who's there with us today. That doesn't mean I have any dual citizenships, by the way. <laughs> Touch wood. Sometimes you've got to laugh or you cry. <laughs> it is a great thrill to be with you here today. It really is. It's not my first time here. I was there with Kieran last time, Tim, and I think you're doing a much better job, mate. I'll, I'll, uh, don't worry, I'll see him tomorrow. I'll tell him myself. Um, but it's great to have you here, uh, and thank you very much for hosting us here today. Uh, to Paul and all the team at Daltone House, uh, great to see that we have so many people here today and all the money goes back to the Shire afterwards. <laughs> he does a great feed wherever you're doing it, whether here in town or, or back down there in Sylvania Waters where it all began. Um, it's, it's also a great thrill to be here with my wife Jenny, um, who has joined me here today and is a great friend of Joseph and, and Angela. Can I also acknowledge a number of my colleagues here today as well? But I, before I do that... Um, a very good friend who at first I, I held back from calling him Saidna because I see that as a real term of close affection between friends and when I first met him I didn't feel it appropriate to refer to him in that way. But now over some years now where we've worked together on many different issues I'm very pleased to call uh, Bishop Tarabay Saidna my friend. I was with him those years ago when he was ordained in, uh, in Tannerine, which is a beautiful village, uh, at the same time as I travelled with Joseph around many of the villages in, in northern Lebanon, and uh, to get firsthand a sense of the, beauti be uh, the beauty and the history and uh, the family and the culture and the food, <laughs> which is great. And uh, so it's wonderful to work together uh, with Bishop Tarabai. Um, to, to John Ajaka, my good friend, and uh, to David Coleman and Mark Kure from across the river, but David, my, my parliamentary colleague, who does an outstanding job chairing the House Standing Committee on Economics. To Philip Ruddock, 
who needs no introduction in this room, an honorary citizen, I think, of almost every country in the world now, having toured the world on our, uh, as, as the Special Envoy on Human Rights. It's great to see you, Philip, and it's great to see you back here at home. Uh, Thomas George as well, um, to you also as the Deputy Speaker here in New South Wales and a, and a, great, um, a great son of Lebanon. And Joe Qatar, thank you very much for your introduction and to be here with you also today. Our economic story in Australia is fundamentally an immigration story and a small business story. That's what our e economic story in this country is. The success of our small business community has ensured that we enjoy a prosperity in this country that has been generated for millions of Australians over generations. And that has a large part to do with it with Australia's story of immigration. The migration of ideas, of innovation and ingenuity, not just people. The story of sacrifice, hard work and a commendable willingness to have a go in the land of the fair go. This has always enabled our newer citizens whether they came over 200 years ago or one of those 12,000 refugees that Australia has extended a hand to in one of the most difficult periods in, in the history in Syria. Whenever you've come and however you've arrived, this has always enabled our new citizens to get ahead and to stay ahead in this country in a way that they could never have dreamed of from whence they've come. And all of us as Australians have been the beneficiaries over this over centuries. It has positioned our economy for growth and prosperity. Around 30% of Australia's workforce was born overseas. And that figure has been gradually increasing since the 1990s. One in 50 businesses in Australia is owned by immigrants who arrived on our shores from the Middle East or North Africa. But this is the one I really like. Lebanese Australians in Australia have one of the highest rates of self-employment of any ethnic group in this country. This is an entrepreneurial culture. <laughs> a highly entrepreneurial culture. Having picked up their lives, starting again some 15,000 kilometres from their birthplace, they firmly believed a new start in a new country would bring new opportunities. And they have. This is a room full of Australians and families represented in this country who understand everything about the economics of opportunity. This is a room who understands that seizing your opportunities in Australia is all about the contribution you can make, not the contribution that you can take. That is something that is well understood in this room, I have no doubt. And that fairness is about a fair go for those who are prepared to have a go. That's how we measure fairness in this country. For those, regardless of what setbacks they have in life, whether those setbacks are language, or those setbacks may be a disability, we, men of us are afflicted with things that can hold us back. But in this country, in this country, if you're prepared to have a go, then you'll get a fair go. And for me and the Turnbull government, that's what fairness has to be assessed by. You can't measure fairness by, look, that, that person over there is doing better than me. What matters is how well you're doing and how well you're applying yourself to your challenges and your opportunities. And fairness is about ensuring that people who are about uh, unwilling to apply themselves can have that opportunity to improve their circumstances and get the support they need to be able to realise their own dreams and their ambitions in this country. The story of Lebanese business success in Australia is exactly what we need to showcase, to inspire a new generation of Australians, to encourage them to think big when they start small, to look beyond their own circumstances of the present and set out on a pathway to achieve something of great significance, to see the better days ahead and to seize them. This is what I call the economics of opportunity. And that has been lived out by Lebanese Australians and their families 
since they've been here as early as the 1860s and even before then. Let me tell you a few stories that you'll be familiar with. I'm told that Joseph Kairouz remembers the order like it was yesterday. Three lambs and a quarter cut of beef. Humble beginnings. This was the day that Joseph would finally realise his dream, conceived when he watched his father's work in his butcher's shop, idolising both his passion and his craftsmanship. Joseph was in business. His fledging butcher's shop in suburban Melbourne had its first customer. This barely a few years after fleeing war-torn Lebanon and being thrown headlong into a strange country with an unfamiliar language and being set out on the street to support the family. In 1988, four years after opening his first shop, Joseph set his sights abroad, exporting Australian meat into such countries as Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Indonesia. Three decades from his cultural upheaval, from that meagre order of lamb and beef, and Joseph's thriving Cedar Meats Company is selling upwards of 37,000 animals per week from a business that has grown from an empty shop to a $160 million a year operation. This is a business that went from one employee doing everything from cutting the meat to balancing the books to 400 direct employees. Joseph had a go, he got a fair go, and we're all the beneficiaries. That's what the economics of opportunity produces. Similarly, the passage of trades and traditions from one generation to the next, from father to son, that is a way of life. If dad was a butcher, fair enough, you would one day pick up a cleaver. Not in anger, I trust. If your, if your family raised livestock, you better be comfortable around animals. And this was Salem Sukkah's story. As a boy, he tore around the foothills of the mountains that towered over his town of Bashari. Helping his parents herd the 400 goats that were living, breathing livelihood for their family. And just like they were for his grandparents and their parents in a way of life for the Sukkahs that spanned four centuries. Now, Salem arrived in Australia as a wide-eyed 18-year-old in 1969, plonking himself in Sydney's heaving western suburbs and working 15 years as a welder without much enjoyment and without much reward, till the lure of the land caught his eye once more. So he went out and bought some goats and a five-acre hoggy farm to match and put his hand to an ancient trade that was already in his DNA. Pleased with the yoghurt he was churning out, he took a sample down to the local grocers for a taste test and by the time he had returned home, there was a message waiting, bring some more. He made $4,000 in his first year in 1985. As things go in Sydney's wonderful ethnic communities, when a taste of homeland is found, well, word spreads very rapidly before Facebook was even dreamt of. There was their own form of Facebook, as occurred in many ethnic communities around Sydney and around Melbourne. And suddenly Salem and his wife were working 16 hours a day, milking by hand, pasteurising the milk, making the cheese and yoghurt and doing the deliveries. Green Valley Dairy now employs 20 workers, has a place on the shelves at Coles and boasts a multi-million dollar turnover. Salem says it's right when talking about what success means now when he said, I'm not worried about how much I make now. I want to run the company successfully and expand. Another story of the economics of opportunity. And the third one I want to talk about today was about Therese Bashara who knows that when you need to knock more than once when it comes to opportunity. She had spied a vacant lot in Camaray and dreamt that she could build a business. Chock full of confidence and backed by, the, by accounts that proved her savings prowess, she took her plans to the bank. They said no way, told her that she could only get... Uh, she, she could only get a $500,000 loan to purchase and develop the land if her husband went guarantor. Now, I guess the bank didn't know Therese very well. She politely declined and found another way, making an ingenious pitch to the gas company to secure their loan on the condition uh, she used their gas on the property. After developing the land in apartments, she sold the property for $3.1 million and Landia Constructions was born. As in many cases of migrant achievement, this success was birthed from adversity. 
Life in the suburbs of Ryde was far from ideal for a kid who grew up in the mountain ranges of a Lebanese homeland. When the Australian economy plunged into a recession in the mid-70s under the Whitlam government, Theresa made a difficult decision that she would never regret, sacrificing her teenage freedom and education in order to get a job and help her family survive. Her start was the bottom rung in a real estate agency. Today, her resume is on display for all to see, dotted across Sydney's skyline, from the Ritz and Waldorf apartments in Cremorne to myriad high-rises in City's West. In accepting her award at Joseph Asaf's now very long-running Ethnic Business Awards, Theresa put it rather succinctly and selflessly, and she said, my biggest contribution to Australia is literally the fact we have created hundreds of jobs. That's what the economics of opportunity is all about. And the stories of that you will find on every single table in this room today. An innate understanding of what that means. When small businesses are championed, when they are encouraged to grow and embrace new opportunities and innovate, Australia benefits. Australia goes forward. We benefit by the creation of jobs. The benefit of seeing real, sustained growth in wages. And that's what Joseph and Salem and Therese focused on in their businesses. Just as Joseph and Saf turned it up here many, many years ago in somebody else's shoes. That's what they focused on. That is what the Turnbull government is unapologetically focusing on as well. It is the pillar of so many of our policies. Because growth is the answer to the challenges that we face into ensuring that the living standards of Australians continue to elevate and lift. And so our children can benefit more, even more, than we have all been able to benefit in this amazing and tremendous and bountiful and prosperous country. But we don't take it for granted. We understand that we need to back business. We need to back small business in particular on the economics of opportunity. Our commitment to small business has been demonstrated already in the most significant change to our tax system for small business than we've seen in a very long time. We've cut the rate of tax for small business to 27.5 and it's going to 25 for businesses now, including this year, up to 25 million and the 1st of July next year it goes to businesses of 50 million. We've lifted the definition of a small business from 2 million to 10 million. Around 100,000 additional businesses are now included in the definition of a small business. 100,000. That's millions of additional Australians that now are defined as working in a small business. And importantly, what that means is they get access to the instant asset write-off, which we extended again in the most recent budget doing your GST on a cash basis because we understand that if you're a small business, managing your cash flow is what it's all about. It's the difference between staying open and, and, and closing down. Pull depreciation, things like this. The advantages that are there for small business shouldn't have stopped at companies at 2 million. They should have always gone higher to 10 million. And against the opposition that we face on this, we've done that. We've made that change. And we just haven't talked about it in a parliament where nothing was supposed to get passed, we have legislated it, and it is law for small business. In addition to that, not only have we acted when it comes to the taxation rates that small business faces, we have also acted on something in the last week that you may have missed with all the hubbub and all the nonsense and all the noise that comes out of Canberra, which I can understand that people would basically just turn down the sound on all of that whether you're a politician or a journalist or anyone else. Australians, I think, are growing very tired and frustrated about just what is a wall of noise in Canberra. But last week, we legislated changes to the misuse of market power rules under our Consumer and Competition Act, which puts small businesses on a more level playing field with large businesses. And those laws have been changed, and further laws will change when we come back to Parliament in a few weeks' time which will follow through on those changes, which means that small businesses with the assistance of an effects test and laws which prevent large businesses from unreasonably standing over small businesses as they seek to get a foothold and build their business, the law will be more on their side today as a result of what the Turnbull government has done than it has in... This is a reform that 
people have been in the small business community been seeking to champion for more than 20 to 30 years. And we've acted on that in the interests of small business. We've also acted in areas to support small businesses who innovate and research and try to create new opportunities in the marketplace for them. And I'm particularly glad David Coleman is here today because it was David's work on the House of, House of um, the, the House Committee on Economics and in other fields because of his background that ensured that in the first budget I delivered that we acted on angel investors. Angel investors to provide tax incentives for investors to get involved and support startup companies, not after it's all come good, but to be able to support them when they first come in. Because we know, particularly for tech startups and other new startups, that there's plenty of people who want to like you 10 years down the track when you're at Lassian and things like this. But the investors that you need are the ones you need early on in the face. And so we've changed the Tax Act to ensure that there are more uh, generous arrangements for those investors, whether on capital gains or other provisions, that ensure that when, when the good times come, as a result of them taking a punt and investing in those businesses, they will reap the reward in a way that is more befitting the risk that they have taken. Because at the end of the day, we're an entrepreneurial culture and we stand or fall and our living standards rise and fall based on that. We're an open trading economy. And while in days like this, when there is great anxiety about the fact it's been a long time since most Australians have had a decent pay rise, and when the economy has been tough since the global financial crisis, we've been in a global economic funk. And it's not just true here, it's been all around the world, but at least in this country, our economy has continued to grow year on, year out. And we are now in our 20, just be past our 26th year of continuous annual economic growth, the longest running economic growth story in recorded economic history. That is an extraordinary achievement. It's an amazing achievement. And it's been achieved as a result of the sacrifice and application of the businesses that are represented in this room. And the culture that comes from the me melting pot of people coming from so many different backgrounds and walks of life, who have come and seen this country as a place where you can get stuff done, you can make things happen, and the old rules that may have applied to where you come from don't apply here. The old rules that might have held you back, they don't apply here, and they shouldn't apply here. It's been true of everyone who's come to this country for more than 200 years. They came here hoping that things would be better. And the great news for Australia, in the overwhelming majority of cases, that has proved to be true. No less so for the Lebanese Australian community that is represented here today. And during this period over the last, since the global financial crisis over the last decade, small businesses have played a critical role in keeping Australians in a job. In the three years to the end of September last year, profits growth as measured through the national accounts was negative, 0.2% annual per year for three years. You go back 10 years ago, that figure was in double digits for the same three year period. Now a lot is said about the fact that wages have been flat and they have, but can I tell you in the face of declining profits, Australian businesses and particularly Australian small businesses kept people in jobs and they kept them in wages and as modest as those wages growth was, it was coming out of the pocket of small businesses around the country. While they were going backwards, they ensured that their employees stayed in a job, got a wage and could continue to support their families. And what a gift that is. And that gift must be recognised by governments and is by this government through the measures that I've talked about today to continue to back them in, because that is, way, that is the way we realise the better days that are ahead. And they are coming. We're already seeing them. In the last six months, we have had the strongest full growth in full-time jobs in 40 years. I'm not kidding. In 40 years, the strongest growth in full-time jobs. Last financial year, 240,000 jobs were created. That is the strongest full year of jobs growth since before the global financial crisis. Businesses are talking about those better days ahead by employing Australians, knowing that they're coming and they're getting ready. We want to see that flow into greater investment. And you don't get greater investment by raising taxes. You don't get greater investment by discouraging innovation 
from where the productivity comes, from where the real wages growth comes. You get that by investing in the future of the economy, as we're investing in infrastructure, as we're opening up trade. The biggest trade deals we've ever seen in this country have occurred in just the last three and a bit years under this government. Important changes that open up the doors to secure the better days ahead. Now, I haven't gone into politics today, and don't worry, I'm not going to end there. I'm not. Because you, you will form your own judgments about our opponents and the taxes they're planning to increase on family trusts and on small businesses and reverse all the things that I'm talking about. You can make your own judgments about that. But I'm very pleased to stand here as a treasurer in the Turnbull government on our record of cutting taxes, whether it's for personal income or for company taxes, to say to Australian businesses that we know that the country lifts when those who create value can succeed. If you don't do that, your economy eats itself. It's like a snake eating itself from the tail. And we, that is not our vision of the future of our economy. So today it's been a pleasure to be with you and I'm happy to, we're gonna, I think, gonna have a chat, I think, Tim. Um, but I wanna say thank you, not just to the generations that are represented here in this room today, but the generations that came before you. Because their work and your work will mean the generations of Lebanese Australians who call this country home first and foremost are inheriting a rich legacy from you, as is our country. And I thank you. Scott, great to hear what you had to say and, and it's an enormous treat to have you here as the, as the Treasurer of the Federal Government and hear about economic growth. But if I can start with a question about something you alluded to there, the circus that has become... Canberra and the view from outside looking in over the last, say, eight, nine years. Can we and how do we get to a point where the white noise is stepped on and we can allow a government just to do their job without all the interaction? Because it is, it's, it's failing the pub test at the moment. Well, you'd be pleased to know that the government <laughs> is not distracted by these things because we keep on doing the things that we need to do day in and day out. Um, yeah, we've got to tough it out at the moment. We're not easing it out, we're toughing it out. It's pretty tough going with the way politics is at the moment and, uh, and the, the white noise that is out there. But the worst thing a government could do is allow that to consume itself and not continue to focus on the things that frankly are most important to us. There is not uh, a morning or an afternoon that does not pass in the government where we are not focusing on the challenge of, of rising energy prices in this country. It is, it is the single largest economic challenge that we're focusing on presently. There are many others, no, no doubt. The, the amount of regulation there is for small business, those issues, uh, housing issues and so on. But the, the cost of energy uh, is a dominant focus of the government. And, you know, the thing is, you, gotta, you just got to keep putting in the work and trust the work that you're doing. And uh, the election is two years away and uh, we will just keep putting in that work and we believe if we continue to set our priorities right, which is to grow the economy, to lift living standards for more and better paid jobs, to guarantee the essentials for all Australians, whether it's on Medicare uh, or on schools funding, with our historic schools funding due or able to legislate, or um, fully funding the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I mean, Australians look after their mates. It doesn't matter what their own means are. Australians will always look after each other, which is what we're seeking to do. And, of course, making sure the government lives within its means as well. It's hard when you've got an opposition and then you've got someone like Tony Abbott, who's the former Prime Minister, running interference. What can you do going forward there, if anything? Well, I, I don't know if I agree with the characterisation. I, um, is anyone else? <laughs> I think respect's an important thing in Australian public life and uh, I respect the former Prime Minister and the former leader of our party and work closely with him to stop the boats and we achieved a lot together. Uh, politics is a tough business and uh, you know things change and you've just got to keep focusing on what the Australian people want. So look, the answer in many respects, Tim, is the same. Look, wherever the noise comes from, wherever the distractions potentially come from, uh, each member of parliament is accountable for what they say and do and Australians have a way of, I think, of, uh, of working it out. And uh, so long as I think the Prime Minister and, and I and the entire cabinet remain focused on the things that, that I've talked about today, 
and in answer to your questions, then you know, that builds the critical mass, I think, of credibility with the Australian people. Um, because at the end of the day, it's always going to be a choice. As many as the frustrations are sometimes with governments or with individuals or circumstances or events, one of two people will be leading this country after the next election. Bill Shorten or Malcolm Turnbull? And I know who my money's on. Well, it wasn't a great poll today, but you say two years away... But it is two years away, so, so that is the logic to it, isn't it? Because everything, I mean, I work on the Today Show, so every Monday morning there's a chat about the polls. Um, uh, what I've are noticed. You huh? I've noticed. Yeah, of course. You're a regular <laughs> viewer and you tape it if you don't see it live. I know that. But this, mo this morning was another, look, it, whatever indication you take from the poll, but it wasn't a, a flash one this morning. Um, well, it, what matters is what's happening in September or October, depending on which code you follow. Um, and the same is true in politics. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you're elected for a three-year term to get it right over three years. And uh, there will be swings and roundabouts over the course of any parliamentary term. Uh, I mean, well, I think one of the things that uh, uh, people are losing potentially in the media in this country is a sense of history. Now, Philip um, was the father of the House uh, in the last parliament. And he has a, a memory of Australian politics firsthand that goes back to the prior to the dismissal. And he's seen quite a few tumultuous times in Australian politics. And these times, you know, have their moments. But at the end of the day, if you go back to, say, prior to the 2001 election, I was the director of the party in New South Wales at the time. And throughout most of 2000 and, and early 2001, you would have said similar things. And John Howard went on to win a further election uh, after that one. So, look, you, you just got to fo stay focused on your job and where you're seeking to take the country and uh, trust the good sense of the Australian people, uh, not to think uh, uh, that changing course uh, would be good for the economy or for jobs. And uh, in our very strong view, it would not be. What about uh, the future with Donald Trump as President of the United States? Contrasting characters, they couldn't be any more different, him and Barack Obama, or Barack Obama. Uh, they're very, very different human beings. Um, from uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea to the global economy, well, these are, internationally, very distressing times. And uh, what we've seen in recent days in Barcelona um, makes you weep. I mean, you talked about a poll. Well, I woke up this morning and read the same story many Australians did, that um, there was a father who'd gone to Barcelona to identify his son in a morgue puts it all in perspective, really. A good friend of mine lost her father uh, just the other day. And uh, I think the Australian people do have a sense of perspective about these events. And let's not just forget, it was only a few weeks ago we were able to thwart a very serious terrorist attack uh, with, a, with a, an airline coming out of Australia. These, at the end of the day, Australians want to be kept safe and they want their prosperity to be kept safe as well. And uh, when it comes to those two scores, I think uh, the coalition has demonstrated, not just in this government, but every time we've stepped up to the plate in government, to be the trusted set of hands when it comes to keeping Australians safe and growing our economy. So people in this room, and, and we have a, a wide range of uh, all size of business, should move ahead with confidence, should move ahead with a, an upbeat attitude? Well, yes. I mean, our, um, the expectation uh, of, or business condition survey from NAB um, is at the best level it was since just prior to the GFC. And business confidence is also at its highest level think, since 2010. Consumer confidence is, is not as, as strong as both of those numbers. But, I mean, when you look at you know, 240,000 jobs being put on in, in a 12-month period, you don't do that if you're not confident about where the economy's heading. We are seeing globally the, the economy starting to turn. We saw that from the start of this year. Uh, we've seen that flowing through in a lot of indicators, uh, whether it was retail sales volumes in the June quarter or any, any number of other key, key uh, data points. Uh, international visitor arrivals, international education, uh, trade performance. All of these are, are demonstrating a, a, an improvement both globally and that flowing through domestically. And so this is just the right moment, you know, not to lose focus. I mean, there are critical moments in nations' histories when they, if they, if they make a wrong turn and take economic policy in the wrong direction, then, you know, you, you, you throw away a generation of opportunity. And I think we're very much in that 
that very sensitive period of time right now. That is why we are just so focused on the issue of economic growth. You can't have a hospital system if you don't have a growing economy. You can't have an NDIS if you don't have a growing economy. You can't pay pensions if you don't have a growing economy. I mean, that's why growing the economy matters. That's why business succeeding matters. If that doesn't happen, then all of this is just academic. And that's why we're evangelically passionate about growing the economy and unashamed about it. And we have this contrast at the moment where you've got us championing the economics of opportunity and the alternative is one of indulging the politics of envy. I know it is tough for many Australian families who have not enjoyed the growth that other parts of the economy has. But the answer to that is not to tear someone else down. That doesn't make your circumstances any better. It doesn't change them at all. The answer, I think, is to build all Australians up. The thing about tearing people down or bringing people down is, is an interesting question when it comes to multicultural Australia. I really enjoyed your three anecdotal stories and it's very similar to my Jiddu, my grandfather's story. George Mansell came here, five kids, nothing. His wife was pregnant, went on to be successful through uh, sh sheer hard work. But some of the messages we get, I know, and democracies, uh, you, can't, you can't work out who's, you can't be 100% sure of who's going to get to Canberra. But some of the comments of Pauline Hanson and others when it comes to multicultural Australia and xenophobia, um, where do you stand on all that? And how important is it for us to move forward as a country and embrace who we are as Australians from all different backgrounds? I can understand when people's wages aren't going up and they're anxious about rising cost of living, that people will look for reasons why that's happening. And that can lead some to, frankly, blame the three things that have actually made us prosperous in this country over more than two centuries. Immigration, trade and foreign investment. These three elements, almost without peer, have underpinned the success of the Australian economy for more than two centuries. And you don't cut off your nose to spite your face. Yes, you have to keep them in balance. I understand that. Philip and I have been immigration ministers where we both understood that the reason you had to stop boats was to ensure that Australians did not lose confidence in the positive nature of our immigration program. We wanted to save lives, that's true. But it was something that Philip and I used to speak often about when we were in the parliament together, that we did not want Australians to lose faith in immigration as being a positive thing for our communities. And overwhelmingly, Australians do feel that way. But in, when times get tough economically, then people can drift off into believing that that is the reason why their, their situation is as it is. And so it is important that we retain the integrity in our immigration program, that our borders are secure, and we have tight rules on immigration, and it serves the national interest. Just as it is true that uh, our trade programs have to be in Australia's interests, and that our foreign investment programs have to have tight controls and are in Australia's interests. But let us not turn back on the things that have actually made us prosperous and deny them to our kids. Good message. I, I've really enjoyed coming here today for so many reasons, but one of the big things is just to hear people speak and hear all the messages of people here, and I'm sure that everyone at every table has got their own story of where their parents and grandparents came from, whether it was from Ireland or Lebanon or wherever uh, the, uh, the world may have brought them from. We have three sparkling questions in the audience. I know you're done on time. So we have three sparkling questions. It's up for us to try and find where those three sparkling questions are. Question one, I'll bring the microphone, my dear sir, over to you. Just as before, you, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation is it is my intention early next year to actually uh, visit Lebanon as treasurer and I've been working, uh, uh, working with the chamber um, to see how we can uh, orchestrate uh, having a delegation or things of sorts at that time. So please stay tuned for more details on that. Um, it's an important uh, relationship and I... My apologies to the Consul General for not acknowledging him earlier. Um, we're working closely uh, with both our, our counterparts in Lebanon uh, to ensure that that can be another uh, great opportunity for cementing uh, Australia-Lebanon relations. Treasurer Anthony Hashem, Australian Consultant Engineers. Um, thank you very much. It's been quite interesting. 
Uh, what I'd like to know, I guess is my question is related to a different side of the economics, but I'd like to know your views about the same-sex marriage, please. I'm opposed. <laughs> I'm opposed, and as Treasurer, you would be happy to know that uh, for the next couple of months, I'm not going to be giving people lectures on the topic. Uh, I'm going to be focused on managing the country's finances, and I'm going to be managing on growing our economy and supporting small business. Others are free to participate. I encourage people to register and have their say because at the last election we said we were going to give Australians their say. I mean, that's my view. Um, there might be many views on the topic in this room today. I know what the, I know what the bishop's view is. <laughs> he shared it with me on many occasions and we enjoy a, a great meeting of minds on that topic. But an even bigger issue than the one that you've just asked but I think is related to it is religious freedom in this country is incredibly important. I mean, whether it's our, our Christian heritage, which is acknowledged in the Constitution specifically, um, or the freedom of religion that is acknowledged in our Constitution, the ability to worship and, uh, and have faith as, as, as our own spirits dictate, I think is enormously important. I'm a big believer for the role of faith in our society. I think it has been a positive force for good. You only need to look at the outstanding work uh, that Bishop Tarabai did before he was the bishop in education and how he was working with young people in the Lebanese Australian community and continues to maintain that passion. Um, in, in Sayedna, you see faith in action. He's an amazing man. Okay, we've got a question. Someone wanted to bag the sharks in a question, but I, I, I didn't allow that to happen, okay? So we're going to go to another question over here. Good afternoon, Minister Tim. Michelle Arras is my name. We, we also, uh, six of us siblings, are all entrepreneurs and all we can say is thank God for Australia and may God bless this country. It has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. One problem that I, we, we all as a family have faced recently is that our, our brother, who's also an entrepreneur, not a druggie or, you know, took his own life and he could have got help but because of bias you know I'm a man I you know you know I can't be seen as mentally you know not right and it was devastating for all of us and then I look around and I think well where is the mental health what is it you are doing as a government for every one of us because you speak to anybody and everyone has someone in their family or in their lives that is touched by this mental illness, whether it's depression, whether it's um, uh, um, anxiety, whatever it might be. But it's, it is something that has to be addressed by everyone, each and every one of us, because we are losing too many, too many of our loved ones. We're probably losing them more then airplane accidents, car accidents, and so forth. But everybody hides it. It's time. You know, a while back, it was done on, on AIDS. You had the Reaper, and it was fantastic. Everybody got to learn about AIDS. So what's going on with mental health? Why can't we do something? So please help me. Where do I start? Thank you all. Thank you. The figures, I understand, is around four or five Australians will take their own lives today, on average, every day. And thank God that the awareness of mental health issues is different today than it was five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. Um, it, is a, it is a blight and it affects people of all ages, um, whether they're young, particularly young men, young boys, um, through to those later in life, it, it, it is a scourge across all, all generations and all ages. And as, as government both today and, and last time we were around, it's, it's an issue that we've actually put a lot of resource into, whether it was the starting the Head Start programs, Headspace programs that we did um, when we were last in government and continue to fund strongly now. The work that we do, particularly in mental health, um, for uh, return service men and women coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that, but also the work we do for their kids 
Um, in the budget before last, we put funding in a program for respite for the children of Defence Force veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, this, this is taking the lives of so many veterans every year. We've invested in the last budget of increasing the resources so the response time when they're calling for this sort of help is there and it's available. And John Howard used to always talk about the ever receding finishing line when it came to big policy challenges and I think mental health is one of those and it'll continue to be an important focus of our government. We are investing more in different types of programs to reach different communities. I think in particular cultural communities, we've got to be careful that it's an issue that's um, not taboo, that it's an issue that can be talked about, particularly amongst men in, in, in particular communities, and we need to be alive to that, and we need to talk about it as blokes, um, and uh, uh, whether it's you know the Are You OK program, um, which was actually started by a friend of mine who I went to school with, um, or the many other uh, outreaches that are out there. Um, it is a a big issue for our community and I can assure you that it has a very high priority for the government. But uh, if you've given me your details, I'll be happy to give you an even more complete sort of uh, itemised account of, the, of what we're doing. Thanks for that, Scott. And thanks for asking that question and sorry uh, for the tragedy in your family. Um, and that Are You OK program is the most extraordinary program and I think it's important for everyone here, we're a male-dominated audience here, to ask your friends about that. I had a friend on the phone today for uh, his wife called me about his life and where he's at. And uh, we need to have the conversation. There's little doubt about that. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Brendan Mayer. I'm a partner at Colin Biggs and Paisley Lawyers. Uh, we actually do run the Are You OK program through our firm and uh, I think it has been a great benefit to a great many number of our people. Uh, I'd commend it to everyone. Treasurer, I'd like to thank you very much for a great talk this afternoon. I think it was very interesting listening to you speak about uh, the history, the rich, diverse culture of Australia and also having a, a vision for a future and also talking about how none of us should take, us for, take this great country for granted. I travel a little bit and I always feel very fortunate to come back to such a wonderful country. What I'd like to ask as my question is, I think technology is having a tremendous change and a tremendous influence on our world now. We've got companies like uh, Google, Amazon uh, setting up in Australia, uh, perhaps changing the culture and the way that uh, small businesses like the ones you spoke about today operate. Uh, what is the Australian government's plan for approaching this uh, issue, dealing with uh, the challenges that are faced by Amazon and, and Googles and uh, just other technologies and how do we create a, a better technological future for our children? Well, as you're probably aware, thanks for the question. Uh, and in not long after Malcolm became Prime Minister, we um, we delivered the national, uh, the NISA program, um, the Innovation and Science Agenda program. And that one of the measures in that program was the Angel Investing um, initiative that I spoke about, which David had championed uh, prior to uh, we made that announcement. And so, whether it's in tax incentives for innovation, uh, working more on collaboration. Uh, through our own research agencies and institutions, the CSIRO, Data61, organisations like this, a, a major project we've had Data61 working on more recently. Data61 is the, the research, computer um, digital technologies research uh, arm of the government. We've had them working on blockchain technologies and all the applications of blockchain technologies. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, um, it's a distributed ledger system which basically for the, say the Australian stock, stock Exchange would enable real-time settlement of transactions. Now, if it's this, the ASX is working on that at the moment and we ensured that we provide some regulatory space for them to get on and develop that, I mean, you just think about it. When you're moving from several days settlement to real-time settlements and being the first stock exchange in the world to achieve that, what that will say about Australia and, and our, our sense of uh, uh, advancement on technology. Um, but the, So the collaboration between the corporate sector and our university sector is an air, area that needs a lot more work. Um, if you go to the United States, as many of you do, you will see uh, a hand in glove, a seamless connection between uh, their tertiary and research sector and the corporate sector. And we are working on ways to actually bring those two things closer together. And that obviously in the day means how you fund a lot of those institutions and incentivise them to partner more with business on how they work up 
uh, their, their technological advances. The other area is, is in the area of financial technology. Now, if there's one area that can completely transform small business, it's the take-up of fintech applications and the digitising of their businesses and their payment systems. Now, if we can get small and medium-sized businesses all across the country adopting those forms of payment, uh, we've got our payment systems platform from the RBA, which is coming online by the end of the year, then that has th the opportunity to really revolutionise our economy. I mean, up to 30% of your time running a small business could be given back to you if you fully digitise your business. Cloud accounting, all of those sorts of issues means that you can go back to running your business rather than you know, uh, spending all of your time on handling accounts and things of that, matter, of that nature. So FinTech, we've established our, our regulatory sandbox, um, which means that we're allowing small um, FinTech firms to go in in a, uh, an environment where they have uh, exemptions to various regulation to see if they can get their ideas working with real live customers and... Uh, for a period of time, they can do that for around six months or so, and if the uh, if the concept is proven within that, then they can take those companies and go live. Uh, they would then be supported by crowdsourced equity funding, both for what is currently publicly listed companies, uh, but also will extend to proprietary companies uh, by the end of the year. So there's a lot of things happening in, in all of that space. You probably wouldn't have heard about too much of it because there's been a bit too much other white noise coming out of Canberra. But uh, while that's all happening, I can assure you, Tim, we're getting on with it. Look, there's one, there's one last little question. I know you dusted for time, and it was very nice of you to give us your personal mobile. We're going to give it to everyone here today. Um, it was Sharks a, by eight. <laughs> <laughs> the mighty Penrith Panthers also came in in 67 to win the 2017 competition. One more question. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for your opening remarks that as the Australian story is one of immigration and certainly multiculturalism. Uh, my name's Stacey Martin and I'm an investor, migration and international business consultant. Um, and I'm not sure if you remember, but just prior to your election, we were having a uh, pizza cooking dinner down here at Signorelli's with Migration Alliance with yourself and Jenny. And I asked you prior to the election what your view was on the significant investor visa program. Now, I'm interested in your comments that uh, in the first few years of that program, which attracts an investment of $5 million as a pathway to permanent residency uh, in Australia, there were uh, more than 1,600 applications. But since there's been some fiddling with the program, that's dropped to less than 200 in the last two years. I'm interested in how you feel about that now, given that was one of the, the key things that you were passionate about at that time. Well, I'm, I remain passionate about it. What changed, for those who aren't familiar with the program, is... Um, the Trade and Investment Minister was given responsibility for defining what the criteria of what investments these significant investors had to be making. Now, what we're seeking to attract under the Significant Investor Visa Program um, are people who are going to come, invest in businesses, and, uh, and eventually, over a, you know, a generation, uh, hopefully transfer uh, the, the, the gravity point of their businesses in Australia. Um, previously, the rules said, oh, you had to take out some bond investments and things in Australia. Well, Australia doesn't have any real problem in getting people to buy our bonds. They're one of the most sought-after bond, bonds in the world, um, our, our Treasury bonds. So, um, there was a change to the investment criteria. So, I would hope that those who are coming under the program aren't coming to buy a visa, but are coming to invest in new startup businesses, provide venture capital, uh, invest in new development opportunities. And where that's happening, then I think the program continue to work well. So I'll, I'll really judge its success on the sort of investment and businesses that are being based in Australia rather than just on the volume of, of numbers that people might come through. Um, so, look, I, I think the program you know, needs some tinkering, but um, in, in principle, I st still think it remains a very positive program. Um, when you think more broadly about skilled migration to the country and you think about our health, uh, research sectors. I mean, the biggest growth in jobs in our country in the future will be coming out of the human services area, the health area, education. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's going to go and be a nurse and a, and a teacher. What it means is people um, uh, starting businesses and working in businesses that are developing biomedical technology. They're in, uh, I mean, I visited a tremendous business down in Melbourne after the budget, which had developed diagnostic uh, uh, machines um, uh, supporting IVF. And they're exporting those machines all around the world today. And they started off, well, they're in a large, um, uh, a large med tech firm and they've gone off and started their own business and they've done tremendously well. 
that is where Australia is increasingly going to have our competitive advantage in the future. And we need to be able to bring the best and brightest of the world who want to come and live here. I mean, one of the best things we've got going for us is that people want to live here. They all want to live here. And the best and brightest come and live here and invest their capital and their energy and their brains and their commitment, then we'll all be the beneficiaries as we have for more than two centuries. Yeah, little question. We are the lucky country, as was written all those years ago. Can we get a big round of applause for the Federal Treasurer, Scott Morrison? Scott, always good to chat, mate. Appreciate that.